coming up on the Can of Cribs podcast. Callus culture, like when you get super into it, you can grow any organ in a plant. You just got to crack the code of it. We're growing like a like a brewery, you know, those giant metal tanks. Yeah. They'll fill that up with cells from medicinal plants and then they add something and then it turns them all into trichomes and then they just <laughs> harvest the tank. You could produce that certain terpene and maybe that terpene is worth more than anything else that you could even grow because it's such a unique compound. Hey, I'm Nick, creator of Canna Cribs and Growers Network, where we have educated millions of people on how to elevate their craft. I have toured some of the largest grow operations, befriended the best growers, and built a network of the top cannabis companies. Join me on this next adventure where I document history with the pioneers shaping the global cannabis industry in real time. Welcome to the Canna Cribs podcast. The Canna podcast is brought to you by the top brands in the game. We have six categories we want to highlight to help you elevate your craft. Starting off with Cultivation by Grodan, Lighting by Horticulture Lighting Group, Nutrients by Athena, Climate Control by Quest, Post Harvest by Green Bros, and Dispensary by Trees. Thank you to these partners for helping us create this podcast and helping us bring more knowledge to the world. If you want to support the Canna Cribs podcast, head on over to the link in the description or go to growershouse.com and check out these industry leaders today. Hey, thanks for watching. Would you like your own Canna Cribs episode? What about $20,000 in facility upgrades? Well, my friends, you're in luck. Sign up today for the Canna Cribs and Hawthorne sweepstakes for the chance to win. The sweepstakes ends April 2023, open to U.S. residents, excluding Florida and New York, and over the age of 21. You can check out the full sweepstakes rules on the application link below. I'll also post in the comments. Best of luck. How the heck did you get involved in the medicinal herbs industry? Tell me how it all started. Yeah, so I mean, I guess I'll take you back to the beginning, kind of like my education and background. Um, cool. I always loved plants, so I knew I was going to go to school for that. Um, I went to Ohio University for environmental and plant biology. And then during my time there, I worked in an algae lab, actually. Um, so I was studying red algae in the lake and like river systems of Ohio and Kentucky. Um, and then after I graduated from there, um, I did a small publication on, on red algae in Ohio, Kentucky and their photosynthetic capacity there. Um, I got a job in Arizona actually as an extraction technician. So we were extracting compounds from medicinal herbs. Um, at that time, we were doing CO2 extractions and um, you were unable to make a crystalline product out of a CO2 extraction. It always came out kind of soupy or liquid. Um, so we were tasked with making a crystalline product um, for people and then also uh, making formulations with medicinal herbs. So. We were making dissolving strips, um, topicals. Our, our focus was for infants and um, drug addiction. So we were making anything that was non-smokable. So any type of patches we were trying to make, we made gum, things like that. So that's kind of how I got introduced into like that medicinal herb space. Um, then from there, I started working for a third party of uh, the uh, state of Arizona. I was testing water there for a while, um, doing contamination. Um, testing. So I did a lot of water chemistry there. Kind of wasn't what I was feeling, not not a fan because I really wanted to work with plants. Um, and then I got a job over in California um, working for a um, human stem cell based cosmetic company. But wow. um, we sell to other countries as well. And a lot of Asian countries, um, they don't let human based products come into their cosmetics. So they brought us as a team to bring plant-based products. Um, and then their form of that was through tissue culture. So we would actually do tissue culture on a bunch of medicinal herbs and scan all of their compounds. And then we would test them on human cell lines. We would test them on skin cells, on stem cells, on fat cells, and see how that they would react to them. Um, and then we would develop products based off of those um, compounds. And then the way that we would be able to actually grow them up super fast and produce enough of what we wanted to um, was through tissue culture. So we were able to either grow the plants whole and extract them, or from there, we could actually make a callus, which is just a bunch of cells that are disorganized. It's pretty much a tumor for a plant. 
um, but you can grow them in liquid and then they actually pump out their compounds. So I started to specialize in bioreactors. So machines pretty much that could feed the cells. All, these are all plant cells to feed the right. plant cells and pump out things. So an example would be like rosemary. Um, they have a lot of terpenes inside of them. So like rosemary acid, things like that. So we would try to overproduce those type of compounds. Um, from there, I actually got poached um, from another medicinal company um, because they saw all the things that I was doing and they wanted to incorporate that into this type of niche space. Um, so then I started working there, building an entire lab of uh, tissue culture from the ground up, buying all of the equipment, all of the materials, all of the chemicals, hiring the staff, writing the SOP, building the layout. So I was able to see from A to Z exactly how to put together a lab, how to utilize the lab, um, how the SOPs actually work in there. Um, and then from there, I'm actually, um, you know, starting my own business right now. We run, it's called modern farm Uh, and we actually use a bunch of tissue culture products as well, um, to make pain creams. And, um, also, uh, we're trying to conserve rare cactus right now. So we're specializing in rare and endangered medicinal plants and cactus. Um, and trying to grow them and then replant them back into populations and also offer them back to the public so that we can reduce poaching. So that, that's kind of where I am right now, you know, from Ohio to here of like where I got wow. my experience. Incredible. Do you think, David, that um, someone would require an education or college degree in botany in order to understand and implement tissue culture at their uh, farm? Uh, no, not, not at all. Um, the education separate from the degree, right? So definitely you don't need a degree. I don't think to do anything, but education comes in different ways, right? So you don't need an education, but you definitely need to learn, right? So researching all of that material on YouTube or, or learning from people. Um, I had a really great mentor, um, Dr. Alex, who actually taught me a lot of my tissue culture things. This is completely outside of school. This is actually like starting oh, wow. to work in the company day one. I, I was introduced into tissue culture at school. They had a, an orchid lab. Orchids are like the number one thing that people use for tissue culture because it requires a mold to infect the seed in order to germinate. So if you go through tissue culture, you don't need the mold and you can make a ton of like special species. <laughs> um, but it's just more about the, the gain of knowledge, right? So I had my technicians that worked for me in my tissue culture lab. Um, they were only high school graduates and then taught them everything from media preparation, apical meristem tissue culture, um, RNA extraction to do HLV testing for, um, you know, disease and viruses. So it's not required. It just is the, the eagerness to learn is required. Absolutely. Yeah. And key word there, mentor. Um, I think that is a, a huge overlooked aspect in some of the best people in uh, farming industries is just having a mentor or multiple mentors to help you get to where you want to go. Um, and you're exactly right. You do not need a degree. Um, you need passion, work ethic, um, you know, showing up on time, uh, and, a, and a great mentor can get you pretty far. For sure, for sure. I mean, I'll, I'll talk about it a little bit later on, but um, all of my genetic engineering work that I've ever done for all of these companies or anything, I learned on the job site. I learned wow. by my mentor pushing me. He tried to push me as a PhD student. That was his like goal. So he really kept pushing me and pushing me to learn. And I was able to learn all of that outside of school um, through experience and just trial and error for the most part. What was that uh, internal dialogue of getting your PhD or continuing to pursue your your professional endeavors? Uh, how did that go? Yeah, so I chose not to do a PhD just because I am currently doing exactly what I want to do. Um, and I feel, again, kind of like what we were talking about is if if I have the drive for the knowledge, I can keep expanding it without needing to go through that type of academic program. It's great. It, it's an option but it's not really what I'm looking for at this exact moment. Um, plus there's plenty of online courses that you can learn a lot of free education. Um, there's an app that's called like EDX. I mean, there's a, there's a ton. Coursera is another app. They offer completely free courses from like MIT, Harvard, 
um, Yale, and then they're free. If you want to pay, you can get a certificate from them. So I'm always advancing my degree, you know, as much as I can. I just got CRISPR certified um, as well. So, you know, I, I just don't feel that there's a need for it right now. And I'm able to do exactly what I want to do. Yeah, no, that's incredible. Um, let's dive into tissue culture, starting at the the 30,000 foot view. What is tissue culture? Yeah, so the basic idea of tissue culture is being able to grow tissue organs or cells in a sterile condition, right? So it could be plant, human, animal, but for plant tissue culture, they're super unique because every plant cell is totipotent. And what that, mean it, what that means is that it's a stem cell of a plant. So in the plant world, we call them meristematic cells, or you hear people say like apical meristem. Um, those are the stem cells in the plant world, right? So like if you needed to conceptualize it, it's the same thing. Those cells can turn into anything. In the human world, once you turn into a cell, like a certain, like a liver cell or something like that, it's usually you can't go backwards. For plants, you can turn into a leaf cell or a pollen cell or a flower cell. And through tissue culture, we can revert that all the way back and then reorganize it into a plant. Or we can also just take an existing plant and get it to multiply a little bit quicker. Right, so the, there's two forms of tissue culture that most people will say is there's apical meristem, which is usually reserved for removing viruses um, or any type of diseases, and then you have nodal propagation um, or micropropagation. So that's where you actually take a already growing existing plant or shootlet, and then you put it into tissue culture so it makes a bunch of those. Right, um, so that's kind of like the basic overview of tissue culture, but then like the nitty gritty part of like the process of that tissue culture, you know, is you have a main plant, you're going to go ahead and cut the tips off of that plant. You're going to sterilize it by putting it through a bleaching process, which is uh, an alcohol rinse and then a bleach rinse. Um, and then from there, you're going to make sure you rinse all that off and then you put it into your agar solution. The agar solution that you're putting it in, that, that gel that you usually see inside of boxes for the most part, that has every single nutrient that your plant needs inside of it because you're making the gel. But for the most part, it's going to have every nutrient inside of it. It's going to have a carbon source, which is sugar, um, because in tissue culture, the plants are actually consuming. So they're eating sugar and actually off-putting oxygen. Um, and, and CO2. So they're putting off both gases, unlike traditional where a tree is outside, it uses the sunlight, converts CO2, creates its energy through there. This is actually consuming sugar. So we have our sugar, our nutrients, water, and then there's agar, which is just a solidifying agent. Um, so you're going to put your plant inside of that box. And then after about two weeks to four weeks, you'll have some new growth that you could either start moving through the process of rooting. You could move through the process of creating more shoots. You could try to be a little more advanced, making callus that you could do more experimentation. Um, but after that point, you're kind of already in tissue culture and you potentially could have plants out within about a month and a half if you're going in a direct route. Um, the other route is obviously like the apical meristem route, um, much longer. So there's that growing tip pretty much. And in the center, there's a bundle of cells, which are called meristematic cells or the stem cells of the plant. Those cells have a higher chance of turning into shoots or turning into plants instead of just, you know, growing into a bunch of callus or turning into leaves or something. It's actually going to be more likely to be organized. So it's less work for you, right? Also those cell bundles grow so fast that the idea is that the virus can't infect those cells. They replicated so fast that the cells that you're cutting out are completely sterile of all virus, all infection. That, that's the idea. So when you have that node, you actually shave off everything under a microscope to get to that core and that core is what you put on the agar. And then it's the same process. It just keeps growing. And then as it grows, you'll just keep subculturing. Subculturing is whenever you take one plant from an existing box and you put it into another. So you're going to keep subculturing for apical meristem culture. The fastest could be maybe four months, but usually the estimated time is about a year 
time lengths. So if you wanted to get up, you know, if you're going to pay someone to do apical Mary stem culture, you're trying to clean up your strains from any type of viruses or anything. Um, just that would be the timeline. Expect to wait eight months to a year. That way they can actually clean it up, make copies for you, back it up. And that's when I would expect to receive it. Nodal propagation tissue culture, it, um, you know, that can take a month and a half, you know, the quickest. Um, what does the, the basic process look like? Is this, is, is this something that you can do at home? Can you do tissue culture at home? Yeah, for sure. Um, I actually, I, I have a YouTube channel where it's called Cacti Fanatici. That's my cactus tissue culture page. Um, I show at home tissue culture videos, super, super simple. Um, in that video, I show that you just need a microwave. So as long as you have wow. a large enough microwave that can put, a safe pressure glass bottle inside of it, then you can do tissue culture at home. So I'll kind of give you a rundown of like at home tissue culture, like what I do at home and like the, the equipment that I have here at least. And then I can give you like, if you're a small business and then even if you're large scale of like the expansion, but the equipment between a, like a small medium business and a large business is actually not that different. Um, so it'll be, so at home it's different, right? So if we're at home, I don't expect anyone to have, a, an autoclave or which is a machine that can reach pressure and temperature and hold it at whatever time that you want it for. And that's how you sterilize things, right? So traditionally when you make tissue culture media, or if you talk to other people, they might say you need an autoclave. What that does is it raises it to 15 PSI at 250 degrees Fahrenheit and we hold that for 20 minutes. And the reason we do that is because we're trying to eliminate spores. So fungus and bacteria are your enemy. And unlike a lot of medicinal herbs, the soil is actually enriched with trichoderma. You don't want that. You do not want that. You actually want your growth space to be as clean as possible, uh, you know, as far away as possible from an actual grow that's happening or an outside environment. You want it to be clean. Um, but just to explain, like in, in my house that I'm in right now, um, one of the rooms, we don't have any central air, nothing like that. So there's no air ever pumping. Um, if there was, you can either shut that off in your room or just make sure you put a HEPA filter in your room if you're crazy and you have, you know, you can hook that up. Uh, but in that room, you know, I just have a wire shelf, a table. I have a fan filter unit. It costs about a thousand dollars. Um, you can find them everywhere. They're used for mycology. They're used for clean rooms. So there's a lot of material out there that you can buy these for, for used up to like $800 to $1,500. Um, but a fan filter unit just blows HEPA air at you, right? So HEPA air is just filtered sterile air. Um, you need that because as I'm breathing, as I'm talking, I'm, there's yeast, there's bacteria, there's fungus that's always coming out because your body is an ecosystem. You know, there's things always on the table, on everything. Um, so you just have to make sure you're working super sterile. So the first thing is having a sterile space. If you couldn't afford one of those fan filter units because they are, you know, they take up space and they're big, there's something that's called a still air box. Again, that's used a lot in mycology or in a, a different type of clean air space where you're trying to not fume anything out. But a still air box is literally a plastic tote, a big plastic tote that you flip upside down, you cut holes in it, and then you put dishwasher gloves and glue them in. That way, when you're working inside there, there's no air that's passing, it's completely sterile. So I'll spray that with Lysol inside the box and that's my clean space, right? So those are just two ways to have clean space. One's a little bit more of a budget using a plastic container. And the other one is, you know, spending a little bit like about $1,000 for a fan filter unit. Um, and then I have a microwave and the ingredients that I'm using and the vessels, right? So you can use a vessel as something like this. So this is called a magenta box. Um, this is like the most common thing. The company is called Magenta. It's a GA7 vessel. If you're, that's the actual name of the, of the tissue culture vessel. Um, but I grow in mason jars. So glass mason jars are a vessel. Um, so pretty much what I'll do is I'll go to my kitchen. I'll have all my chemicals. So I have MS media with vitamins. I have plant tissue culture agar. I have water. And that's it. So um, I'm going to go ahead and mix those all together following the recipe. 
Um, I'm not going to tell you the exact amounts just because it depends on what you buy. So depending on the company that you buy, look at what it tells you because you might be following somebody's recipe, but on the bottle, it'll tell you how much to add per liter. And that's the most important thing. If you keep just regurgitating people's information in this, it may not work for you just because the company changes how much to add each time. Maybe they make the formulation a little bit better, right? So I have my MS powder, I'll weigh that out, put it in my, my mason jar with a plastic top because it's going to go in the microwave. Then I'll put my water inside there. I'll add my agar inside there, which is usually eight grams per liter. Again, it depends on how strong. So if you look at agar, there's a number on there that says gel strength. The higher the number, the less you have to use, the lower the number, the more you have to use, right? So agar, MS, water, all in a bottle, shake it up really well. Oh, and sugar, I forgot sugar. Um, and sugar, right? Because that's what the plant's actually going to feed off yeah. of. Yeah. So I'll put that all inside of a bottle, shake it up really well. If you have a stir, which I do, I'll stir it just so that it mixes really well, but you can just shake it by hand. I'll take the pH of it and then adjust it. So the pH needs to be between 5.6 and 5.8. That is where the nutrients that we're putting inside of our gel can actually be taken up by the plant. So just, and it's very important for the gelling of the agar. So just make sure that you're always between 5.6 and 5.8. I like to lean a lot closer to 5.8. Um, and then once that's- Really maximize that uptake. Yeah, exactly. And honestly, when you start going low after microwaving or pressure cooking, the pH drops about like 0.1, like a little bit. And if you go too low, the agar will turn into jelly. So it'll never set for you. It'll just be like sloshy and liquid. You'll think that you messed up something, but it's always because of the pH if your agar is not setting. Um, and then I go ahead and pop that in the microwave very carefully. I'll microwave it for about 45 second increments and keep going and going until I see bubbles popping up. And again, I'm going to emphasize you have to use a safe bottle, right? So don't just put any type of bottle you're finding you know, there's plenty of bottles on Amazon. Like they're GL45 media bottles. That's the most common one that can actually handle pressure. Um, but I put that in the microwave. I put it on for about 45 second increments and keep going until I see that it's boiling. And then I'll leave it. And then I get, I'll go ahead and do that one more time. After that, it's completely sterile. Um, there could be chances, obviously, of like some uh, spores making it through, but knock on wood, um, I haven't had any issues at all with that microwave method. Um, once it's hot and liquid like that, you're going to go ahead and move it into your sterile space, which is either that plastic tote that you're using or that fan filter unit that's on blowing the HEPA air. And then you're going to pour it into your containers and let it set. After it sets, that it's ready to use. So pretty much we have our media. So I kind of went through how to make the media, but you're going to have your media, a clean space. And I mean, you're pretty much good from there, to be honest. You could even buy pre-made media. And if you have your sterile space, you just go in there and you can begin as long as you have your, your plant tissue. To keep your costs down, David, um, are there ways to make your own agar solution at home? There are. But again, the, the agar is actually one of the most important ingredients and the purity. You don't want to mess it up. <laughs> yeah. I mean... I, I, I'm, on, I'm part of a lot of at-home tissue culture groups, and the agar is the most expensive ingredient. Um, there's two ways around it. One, it's not necessary. So I specialize, again, in, in bioreactor systems. So I grow plants using liquid. It's, it's pretty much where the vessel will fill up with the liquid media, and then it drains. So that's a way around it. Honestly, that's a little advanced. Um, but I do know of people using like, um, there's like telephone brand agar agar. That's like at a lot of like, um, Asian supermarkets that you can find, um, they use those and it works for them, but you might see things. If you're following a paper and you're expecting a result and you get a different result, I would definitely assume it was because of the agar that that's the only thing, but there is definitely at home material that you can you can buy the agar there. But all of these uh, materials, like the MS media, the agar, even the plant hormones, you can order right to your doorstep. 
it doesn't require a special license or anything. You can just go right online, just naming a couple. There's there's Kaisen Labs that you can buy from, Phytotechnology Labs that you can buy from. Um, I think Emerald sells a lot of um, tissue culture materials. So there's a whole bunch of companies that sell materials. My website, we sell like a pre-made mix tissue culture powder that all you do is mix it and add water. It's already pH'd and everything. So there's a whole bunch of things that you can do to be like cost effective. So you don't have to buy each individual ingredient. And like, if you just want to trial it out, you can buy like pre-mixed powders. Um, even with hormones, people have them like pre-mixed and made um, if you go to their website, it'll be like, this is for roses. This is for cucumbers. Like they have it specifically, they like, this is for medicinal plants. Like they have it specifically for everything, like in the industry that they have it already developed that you can buy like pre-mixed powder. So it can, it can be pretty cheap just to start off. So these solutions, David, are for at home. Um, would you recommend a, a different system and a different uh, process for tissue culture at scale? For sure. Yeah. So obviously um, the microwave method is a touch unsafer. If you're not using the right glassware, um, you have to like always inspect your glass to make sure there's no cracks or anything. And then the capacity is super small, right? You don't want to have 10 microwaves going at once where you can only have a couple of bottles. Um, at that point you would buy an autoclave. So you're able to actually process all of your, your bottles and your equipment. Uh, I'm, I'm a lot about the environment. So I'm all about using like, like all the containers that we use are reusable. So with that comes dishes. So um, that that's kind of where you scale up. So the, all of the ingredients that I mentioned, like the MS powder, agar water, that's always the same. The difference is going to be kind of like the workflow. So you might have a technician that's actually devoted to making media 24 seven. That's all they do. And then you'll have a couple more tech, like two technicians that are devoted to actually doing the tissue culture process. Um, with a three person team like that, you could house probably around 10,000 um, tissue culture boxes. So that could be 10,000 varieties that you could hold with a three to four person team um a within like a probably 800 square foot space 1600 square foot if you have a a processing room and a and a tissue culture room you could house so much i know that you were talking about the callus method um, is that more of a, a home grow versus a commercial grow or more of an advanced methodology that you can still do at home for sure, yeah. So it's it's more of an advanced method that you can do at home. Um, it's again, it's just about the knowledge. So once you understand how the tissue culture process is working and how your hands are moving, the sterile process, um, that's where you kind of go into a callus. So a callus again is it's disorganized cells that grow. Um, and when you do tissue culture, it's very common for callus to form. Um, it's very very common and not wanted um, usually when you're doing tissue culture. Um, one, because it's difficult to turn into plants and two, it actually can cause a genetic mutation when you're recreating the plant. It's called somoclonal variation. Um, so it's pretty much like when the cells were separating and fusing, maybe it didn't happen all the way, or there were some mutations that happened along the process and maybe you're changing the ploidy level. So that's the amount of chromosomes that are inside of the plant. Um, and, and when you do that, there can be negative effects affecting the yield or maybe your terpene production or your other type of compounds that you're trying to produce can go down. Sometimes it can be really great and, and super amazing. Um, there's a company in Canada that actually um, was able to increase the ploidy level. So an example is a cannabis plant will be 2N, that's what it's called. If you do that mutation, and usually it happens a lot in callus, it'll now be 3N. And so what that does is your plants that normally are male or female, when they become pollinated, they actually can't cross pollinate anymore. So they were able to create a plant that is not pollinated by male pollen anymore. And in a lot of industries that's super useful, uh, like ginkgos, a lot of like nut trees and things like that. So there's a lot of benefits to 
for doing that. So Callus is a very advanced thing. And if you understand what you're doing, what you're looking for, how to identify like what you actually created, it's a great process that can be used. Or someone like me that was using cell suspension cultures or, or trying to grow cells to pump out certain terpenes or certain compounds, that's definitely where Callus kind of comes in. It's a lot more advanced biotechnology, um, genetic engineering, uh, definitely requires a callus um, phase to do a lot of processes. So it's definitely super advanced, um, but can be done at home. Um, you just need to understand kind of like what each hormone's doing and and how the whole process works. Going back to that education versus degree, you don't necessarily need a degree to do the callus method, a lot of online education that you could follow, but it's advanced. I mean, you need yeah. practice at it. Yeah, advanced. But again, that knowledge is public. Uh, you can go on Google, you can find these papers. And as long, the more you read the papers, you're able to skip kind of like the filler and understand exactly like what recipe did they do? What was the lighting that they did? Um, you know, how many hours were they doing? Like, what were they trying to achieve? Like, were they trying to create flowers in tissue culture or were they trying to create roots in tissue culture? Um, so there's, there's lots of different routes that you can do. You don't even have to, that's a thing like, so you have callus culture, right? But then you have organ culture. So you could grow specific types of organs for plants. You could grow maybe just pollen that you want to use later on for something, or you could grow just flower parts and just uh, male parts that you could create seeds and tissue culture. So there's a lot of like other types of culture other than like the two that I mentioned and then callus culture. Like when you get super into it, you can grow any organ in a plant. You just got to crack the code of it. Hey, thanks for watching the episode today. Did you know that we have a consulting division? We actually help design and build some of the most productive commercial facilities that you see right here on YouTube. If you need help building, retrofitting, or optimizing your commercial grow, hit that link in the description below and fill out the form. Now back to the episode. For all of our commercial growers out there, um, what would a department look like? I know that you mentioned uh, three technicians or three people helping out, maybe a couple different rooms. Could we associate some numbers? And that could be um, how many plants do you think you would be actively uh, managing in order for a tissue culture lab to make sense? And then also um, numbers in the sense of cost. Yeah, generally, yeah, I think so. Um, so it, it really depends on the grower um, and and what your your purpose is too, right? So I, between, you know, everybody that grows these plants, there's a lot of different outlooks on like, you know, they either want like the newest genetics and the old ones are out um, or, you know, they want to really preserve all of the genetics, no matter how old or what they do. Um, so it kind of depends on that, obviously, with the amount of space that you're going to need, right? So if you know that you're going to have to house, so, you know, some people claim they have like 3,000 genetics or something like that. So if you know that you're going to have to house 3,000 genetics, then you're going to have to plan for the space. So I think before I was telling you like two 800 square foot rooms, right, that could produce at least 10,000 vessels. And each vessel would be considered a mother plant. One of those little boxes. One of these boxes. Yeah. One box like this is what we would consider a vessel. And then um, that can preserve your strain. Inside that box, um, you might have, you know, upwards to five or 10 different plants that can eventually come out of it. Um, but it, just to, you know, getting back to it, the reason of why you're doing it is you might have to maintain those cultures or you're trying to like bring out a lot of culture. So the first thing is just your game plan is like, what is your purpose of tissue culture? Do you want to maintain a mother inventory? Because then you're going to need a little bit more space and you can just calculate that based off of each box that you have. But again, just number wise, if you had two 800 square foot rooms, you could house at least 10,000. Um, but if your goal is just to clean up virus and you want to, you're just checking for viruses that are inside of your plants and you want to make sure that they're clean, then you don't need that much space, right? So the room that I have right now is about 200 square feet. Um, and I've never run out of space for my cactus. I have about 400 boxes inside of there. Um, and that's just a shelf. I could probably fit another 
I mean, a, a whole bunch more of plants in there. So you don't, it's not a big square foot that you need. And if you're cleaning up virus, you're getting rid of it as soon as it kind of comes through the process, right? So you're going to clean up the plant, bring it through tissue culture, and then give it back to them. And ideally, if you pair a, a great tissue culturist with, and you are able to have analytic services of, you know, viruses, you might even be able to use your tissue culture service to clean your entire facility. And you don't have a reason to have tissue culture. Um, there's a, I don't know how people feel about this, but there's like a thing about genetic drift. Um, you know, for a very long time, it was assumed that as I hold this mother strain and I cut it, and I used to regurgitate this information. I don't believe this anymore. Um, but as you take a cutting from a plant and you regrow that tree or that plant or whatever it is, that you're kind of expanding the time length of the plant, right? So that branch that you kept taking is now 15 years old. And, and that's the reason why it's not producing well. Um, but there are a couple papers now out showing that it's actually due to virus and disease. Um, so it's a lot of uh, internal pathogens and bacteria, fungus, and specifically virus. Um, that's actually the reason for their genetic drift. So it's not genetic drift. It's, it's fighting for its life pretty much because you're holding this strain now for 15 years. And every time you do that cut weaker and weaker, exactly. You're gaining more viroid, more virus. Every time you're doing a cut, it's not a two to one, but say every time you cut it's double. Now it's four times, eight times, you know, it's probably even, you know, exponential compared to that. So I feel like that is really the reason behind genetic drift. Um, the, there is an argument that tissue culture can, um, help produce, like it, it does regenerate the plant back to when you first popped the seed, right? So it's going to act just like that first time that you put the seed in soil and you grew it, all those traits will definitely come back. Um, but part of that's actually because when you go through tissue culture, because the plants are so tiny and they're under that light, they actually have a higher amount of photosynthetic capacity. So there's more chlorophyll packed per the square footage of that leaf. So it's able to produce more energy, feed a lot better, respirate a lot better. And that is the reason that you see a lot of higher yielding when you go through tissue culture first generation um, compared to maybe like an original plant. But if you popped a seed and you grew that mother and you have, you already know that your facility is virus free, there would be no purpose in my mind other than to preserve the strain and maybe keep it. Maybe you do want to keep it so it'll always be virus free. So let's snatch it now. But there's really no purpose for it if you have a great like cloning and cultivation practices, right? So tissue culture, I always say, is a tool like in the tool belt of nursery, right? So it should be almost a subdivision with nursery because they have to work together. They have to be able to communicate together if they're in the same company, right? If you're a separate tissue culture company, then it's not a problem because then you know your goal is cleaning up and preservation. Um, so then, you know, numbers wise, that fan filter unit that I was telling you um, is going to be your, your, your main cost because that's going to give you like your sterile room. So one, it could just be your cost build out of your HVAC system that actually has HEPA air and maybe is a sterile room. And that is whatever your contractors say it is, but say you're in an empty room, right? You just need your fan filter unit. That's about a thousand dollars. You're going to need a giant steel table to have that on and be able to actually work on. There's probably another thousand dollars right there. Your racks cost about $500. The big ones that are like four by four. Um, so, I mean, in total, honestly, just to set up a tissue culture lab for about under $5,000, you could get working. No way. Yeah. As long as, you know, you just have to have good sterile practice, but for sure, again, I teach at home tissue culture stuff. And some of these people are actually producing enough plants in their home that they're selling them at markets or there's people, you know, for orchids, even the cactus game, it's, it's super um, lucrative to have tissue culture plants. This plant that you're looking at me, like behind me, we have variegated ones, you know, they sell for like $120 each tissue culture thing. So that $5,000 <laughs> that you're putting in comes back super fast, oh, especially if you're, if you're in a medicinal plant field that has viruses that are really rampant in your culture right now, it would save you 
so much money. You, if you're a large scale and headache, yeah. If you're a large scale company, in the millions by removing your virus. So the that small investment, obviously, people is your most expensive cost. So that that's going to the three people the, to help run this TC people. lab. And again, that that's if you're trying to have ten thousand plants. Say you wanted to have on like five thousand and under, two people can handle that. Why are uh? Why are companies still growing from seeds and doing uh, traditional cloning practices? Why don't we see every single commercial grade medical medical plant facility on tissue culture yet? Um, I think one, I mean, with proper planning, it's not as as big of an issue, but it's the turnaround time, right? So if I want to, and it depends if you're large scale, the turnaround time kind of goes away. But if you're just a regular scale tissue culture, like lab space, you might not be able to produce the amount of clones that your grow needs and as developed as they are. Right. So they're going to come out really tiny and they're going to have to kind of grow up from that point. And it might be, you know, a four week process instead of, you know, you can root clones within a week process. So that three week timeline might be actually super pivotal for the company. Uh, so I feel like that that's definitely one of the reasons. Timeline and, and some upfront expenses. Um, I would imagine if you've been doing it for this long, you know, not, not doing tissue culture for this long, there's probably a, you know, some type of thinking of, do I really need it? I, I'm already successful. But I think the way you, you explain it, David, is do you want to be more successful? Do you want to be, be able to be disease free? I mean, there's some upfront expenses. Exactly. With that. Or, um, I mean, one of the main things that I see from a lot of growers is that they'll start, um, you know, blaming the lower growers. So a lot of their technicians and for the yields, there's a lot of drop in yields and all of these things. And then when you find out that it's the virus, you're able to stop that troubleshooting problem, right? So, you know, it's not the feeding. I mean, it could be, but it's most likely yeah. not the schedule that you have. It's not that this plant's completely different. If it's confirmed to have the virus, you know, that's the reason why, right? So it, the, the virus is in a lot of plants, like lily bulbs, especially this is another thing. Um, but the virus will devastate you. you you're going to ignore it in the beginning, thinking that it's not a problem. But when you start showing your investors that you have a $400,000 loss in product and you can't explain why, you know, that's a reason. There's going to be some pointing fingers. Yeah, exactly. But it's great to then be like, hey, where did you get this from? You know, where let's go back and see, like, where is the problem happening? You're able to troubleshoot. And that, you know, I know the virus is kind of separate in like, uh, you know, analytical testing and molecular, but they are one, right? So like understanding plant cell physiology and how they grow, what they should look like. And then if you're advanced into this, you know, going a step farther of like the actual genetics of the plant, right? So we also did a lot of DNA extraction and, and there's like a pivotal word of like, uh, you know, uh, DNA fingerprinting, but all that means is we're just sequencing the plant, seeing if there's a unique sequence in the plant that can distinguish it between another one. Um, but this is all through tissue culture because um, you could do it, you know, outside externally, but in tissue culture, you know, it's sterile, you know exactly what you have. You're kind of able to study it a little bit more controlled. Um, yeah. That's a good point. Um, I'm, I'm kind of curious. So if you're doing tissue culture um, and you want to know what this, this plant is, what type of database do you benchmark it against? Like how, how do you know if you just have a random plant in front of you? Yeah. So there's a couple, there's, um, luckily like a lot of most medicinal plants that are valuable to humans have been studied by universities all over the world. And there's a, a database, a database um, that you can use and we call it, we like blast. So you can put your gene sequence inside of the database and you just press enter pretty much. And it goes through everything in the entire world that has ever been sequenced. And then it matches exactly what you have. Um, unfortunately, for some of these like higher medicinal plants, there's been a lot of legal constraints on them. So some of that information is just starting to come out. Um, I know Medicinal Genomics is a huge company that does a lot of um, testing and things like that. And I know they've pulled together 
um, working with Eurofins, which is like one of the best uh, genomic companies out there um, to make, it's like a microchip pretty much, but a way that you're able to have sequences of like, say, you know, different rosemary varieties, different apple varieties, and you can run them on the machine and it'll tell you which one it actually is. Um, so people are building these type of databases. It's all coming together. Um, there's specific ones for certain plants because there's a lot of communities. Um, like cucumber has a huge database. It's one of like the mostly like widely studied plants out there. Um, so th there's already databases that exist that you can look those up. What we were doing is we were fully sequencing the plant, putting it into our own personal system. So this gives you something that you're kind of creating on your own. Um, but again, you could open source this if you, you know, if you feel that you're part, you want to be part of the community and you can provide that. Um, but these sequences are just uploaded. And then anytime somebody puts it in, if it matches, it'll be like, oh yeah, this is boom, you know, blue variety rosemary or whatever plant that you're looking for. It'll show exactly if it matches up or there's the chances that there is no difference. And maybe there's no way to check you know, the difference between each plant. And, you know, if somebody is telling you like, well, this is this and it is like, maybe it isn't. And maybe there is no way. So it's all coming yeah. out there. It does seem like there are differences. I don't know about, you know, each one is different, but for sure we've been able to distinguish certain plants that have gotten mixed up by re fingerprinting them again and showing that they were actually separate and they were able to separate the clones. So it is possible. I would imagine, um, I know we're going to be talking about seed companies mm -hmm. and seeds and all that stuff, but I would imagine if someone was in the business of selling uh, culture or selling, you know, seeds, um, being able to have that uh, genetic fingerprint would be extremely valuable. 100%. And, and that's associated with the cost of what they're selling it at. So I think our entire industry is growing up. I think that's a great thing. Mm -hmm. um, I think we're, we're learning, new technologies are coming out old older technologies that have maybe been more sophisticated for more years are coming in um, i think it's kind of a, a renaissance time for those blue colored rosemary varieties out there yeah, <laughs> yeah i agree i agree because uh you know I, I do a little bit of consulting at some like other like medicinal plant places and people are like wow this is so amazing this is so new and i'm like no it's been around for blueberries yeah, for a long time. Everything, or cucumbers. Yeah, every everything, you know, tomatoes, date palms, like every bananas, plantains, like that there is no other way other than tissue culture that they are producing those type of crops. So yeah. yeah. Well, we've been, you know, dancing around a couple key words in this interview, if people have noticed already, because YouTube age gates our content and uh, we don't want it to be limited to just a, a little uh, group of people that can watch it. Um, so we're trying to be, you know, safe at home or whatever to appease YouTube. But when it comes to the industry that we're in and that we're talking about, um, do you think, David, there will be a point where it will be just like you mentioned for all those other vegetable varieties, it'll be a hundred percent tissue culture and it'll be more of a novelty factor to be grown the other ways. Yeah, for sure. So I feel until you surpass the small business, right? So I feel that a lot of small businesses or home grows are all about, um, not that big companies aren't about quality, but about like, they're not worried about the yield as much I feel as about like, the quality. So like, you're actually going to have like the taste and the smell and things like that. Um, not that you can't get that through tissue culture, but if you really want to keep trying new genetics and things like that, it's probably going to be better to like pop from seed and trial it out. And then you decide what you want. And then you kind of put it in tissue culture to preserve it and things like that. But definitely large scale production companies, for sure. Um, I know for a fact that that's already going on in the industry um, and larger companies are starting to adopt that and looking for people to do more. Like, honestly, there's even like automated tissue culture now, even in our industry um, that exists where the robots are picking it up and putting it in the media and doing things oh, like yeah. that. So yeah, it's, it's already there. Um, it's definitely going to be there. Um, it's a really way to 
standardized, right? You know, the height of everything, you know, the size of everything. You might even know how many nodes each single cutting is coming out as the yield will most likely be identical every time. If you're doing a first generation cut, you don't even have to worry about viruses because you know that your stock is clean, which you should always check anyways, but you would know that peace of mind that you're good to go. It doesn't matter what strain we choose for production because it's clean, because it's coming through tissue culture. We know that it's there already. We know that we can expand that tissue culture, right? So if I have one mother, I could make, yeah, a hundred clones. But if I need to fill a field full of millions of clones, maybe tissue culture is gonna be a little bit better where I can actually make a million clones in a box and then just put them out. Again, the time link, the timeline will be a little bit longer but with that type of commercialization, you can plan for it, right? So you will start your clones four weeks ahead instead of a week ahead because you know that it takes longer. So the beginning, it'll be slower, but in the end, you're so beyond. Right. It, it requires better time management, yes. uh, planning. Sterility. And it, yeah, sterility. It's more advancement or like just really being on top of it. Again, I'm in my house. I don't have a mm-hmm. HVAC system. It's working great here. I produced a touch commercially for some of the cactus that I'm doing. So it's just about that keeping those boxes, right? Checking them off each time. The, the clean space, proper workflow. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And let, let's really dive into uh, disease prevention. I think that's one of the biggest factors. Um, every every farm that I, well, I'm going to rephrase this. There's a lot of farms out there that have diseases. It could be something as simple as powdery mildew. It could be a deficiency. Yeah. Um, it could be something that's in the air that's you know coming over to their farm. Um, it's very pertinent right now. Uh, for commercial scale productions that are being wiped out um, or hitting their bottom line. Oh, yeah. um, so um, what does that argument look like when you're speaking to a commercial grower, um, when you're talking about disease prevention through the way of uh, tissue culture? Yeah. Um, I mean, just to, I feel like we kind of touched on it, but it's more just saying like that, you know, peace of mind that everything coming out of tissue culture is clean. Um, just to talk on kind of what you said, I'm not going to call anyone out, but you know, when I was doing that, so we had a QPCR, which is a qualitative PCR machine that I would use to, um, check for different viruses. Um, so we did HLV, HSV, BCTV, um, a couple other ones. Um, if there was bacteria or fungus, we would go ahead and sequence it. Um, so anytime that people were going to go ahead and bring clones in, we would go ahead and test them. And nine out of 10 were always with disease, virus, or bugs. So I don't, I mean, I feel like it's very obvious. Um, I think a lot of people kind of just like turn their eye or like don't, I know people don't like spraying, but you know, there's a lot of like natural alternatives that I believe do work super well to like prevent those things. Um, but I mean, it, I would just, it saves you money, time, your facility. You don't have to rebuild because somebody brought, you know, root aphids or, or things like that. Like f- how we were doing tissue culture was a quality control and assurance mixed in. Right. So I know that's not really tissue culture, but it kind of is. Um, because again, just understanding like the process you're doing, why you're doing it, and then the step farther of actually confirming, right? You have a lot of tissue culture labs, which is fine because if you're knowledgeable, you you probably could guarantee it, but they don't have testing, right? Uh, it's not everybody who knows how to do tissue culture knows how to do testing. So you can just say, oh, we do tissue culture to remove the virus. And it's like, well, how do you know that? If you don't have the analytical testing, you could actually be producing millions of plants with virus. Like just because I put a plant inside of this box, that doesn't mean that it doesn't solve the problem. No, I could be propagating the virus. And then if I if I'm a fool and I don't clean my scissors or something in between another strain and I keep going, you could infect your tissue culture stock. And then you have, oh, a peace of mind, it's sterile. And it's that's not true. So that's why you have to kind of keep going a little farther. There's also plenty of companies that offer, you know, cheap testing for like the main viruses that you're looking for. So you just snip a little piece of the leaf off and send it out. You know, so 
it's definitely it, it's pivotal in my opinion if you're a commercial grower to have an in-house quality control and assurance team and personally i would pair them with your tissue culture because you're already a clean safe lab so it's easily able to incorporate all of that equipment into your space already definitely and uh it's great that you have a youtube channel as well we'll make sure to link all those in the description so people can reach out to you continue to learn uh you you are uh super passionate about yeah. this and um I, that's awesome uh, people are also very passionate about the subject of tissue culture that's why we really wanted to do this interview today um there's not enough resources out there for something that should be you know, mainstream in, in our industry. Yeah. <laughs> um, I know that you were talking about genetic engineering as well. Um, how does that play into tissue culture? Yeah. Um, so again, if you're using callus and things like that, you're able to kind of incorporate genes that maybe you could do like cell suspension things. So like at, at my older jobs that I was working at, we were more focused on like terpene productions or any type of metabolites, secondary metabolites that the plants were making. Um, so, you know, say again, just rosemary, rosemaric acid is a, a chemical that it naturally produces. So a way that, you know, we were able to increase that is by putting a promoter, which is pretty much a gene that turns something on and leaves it on. It is not going to turn off. So naturally in the mm -hmm. plant, that gene that's making the chemical that I want, it might not be on all the time. Maybe it's only on when the sun is on me or when I feed it water, or when I give it nitrogen, like whatever causes that chemical to be produced. But if I do it this way, it's always on. So I can produce that terpene at 100% capacity and pump it out. Maybe I can collect it in liquid. Maybe I can collect it in the cells. So that's one way. This is what they're already doing for a lot of the uh, um, I don't know if you've ever seen like the meat, you know, those meats that are made from like plants and stuff. Oh, Beyond Meat, yeah, Impossible exactly, Burger. Exactly. So you're able to, um, my old mentor actually works for a company like that. Um, but things that you're, I, I've read in a paper that people have done is using like soybean and making like hemoglobin in the soy. So it actually is creating like blood, like a type inside of yeah. soybean cells. So it, you know, there's, I've there's so that. many reasons why you could do it one would obviously be like now that they're creating food two is to create pharmaceuticals you can actually create vaccines inside of plant cells and then extract them to give to humans so it's a way again for you know a natural model for people um and then four is just creating new varieties and strains so um something that i have been working on um Com computationally. Um, I don't have anything that I'm working on like physically here with this project, um, but it's for powdery mildew resistance. Um, so there's already been confirmed a powdery mildew resistant gene in cannabis. There's a great paper actually showing the plant that has it and then the plant that doesn't, and then they put powdery mildew all over it. And then after like weeks of growing, one of them is like white. It looks like you almost snowed on it. And the other one's perfect. Not a single like there's maybe like one spore growing on it or anything. And they found that that gene is the reason for the resistance. Um, so I, I've cloned that gene. Um, I had it synthesized. There's companies that will actually, you just pay super cheap. It was like 200 bucks. Um, they synthesized that gene for me that I found. They put it inside of a plasmid, which is a circle piece of DNA that you put inside of bacteria. I put it inside that bacteria. And then I took the, the medicinal plant I infected it with that bacteria. Naturally, this is a natural process. The bacteria passed on the gene for powdery mildew resistance. And then now this plant potentially has powdery mildew resistance, but uh, it needs to go through R&D and all of that. And that project was paused right now, um, but I have everything kind of made in this little side project that I'm hoping to get back in. But that requires a little more like R and D and grow space to get done. But stabilization. Yeah, exactly. Making sure that the gene is actually integrated and that it's working and then, you know, do the same test of putting powdery mildew on it and things like that. But um yeah, that's that's one of the projects that I'm working on um as far as like GMO work for um some of the medicinal plants. Hey, thanks for watching today. We have a quiz for you brought to you by GrowDoc, which is an app that helps you diagnose and solve your cannabis plant problems faster than ever. So this first deficiency will produce a yellow stripping on the fan leaves and in severe cases will begin to curl inward.
What's your best guess? That's right, it's magnesium deficiency. Next up, affecting lower leaves first, this deficiency turns fan leaves completely yellow. What do you think it is? You got it, it's nitrogen deficiency. Now, this deficiency expresses itself on the edges of the leaf. Lower leaves begin to yellow and eventually burn up, stunting the plant's growth. What do you think it is? The correct answer is potassium deficiency. This micronutrient deficiency will cause spindly and weak growth. The leaves will have a unique spotting pattern as they turn pale green. What's your best guess? The correct answer is sulfur deficiency. The final question here, this often debated deficiency is immobile, presenting itself on newer growth first. And later on, the fan leaves will be spotted brown and yellow. What do you think it is? The correct answer is calcium deficiency. Thanks for playing with us today. If you want to check it out with over 40 plus plant problems to browse, including research-backed images, information, and solutions, you'll spend less time diagnosing those plant problems in your garden and more time growing. All it takes is a picture. It's pretty cool and easy to use. Head on over to the GrowDoc app, which is free on both the App Store and the Google Play Store. Or you can visit them on their website, growdoc.ca. Thanks for playing. Could we dream for a moment, David, of what the future of medicinal plants could look like through genetic modification? I know GMOs can get uh, a bad rap sometimes, and um, it's difficult to have a broad brushstroke if all GMO is bad, all GMO is good. It's 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 difficult. It is, um, and, yeah. But could could we dream up um, just like powder mill powdery mildew resistance? What other things are possible? Just takes time uh, to to R and D. Um, like specifically in the medicinal plants Terp or terpene all enhancement. I mean, me medicinal plants in particular, yeah. what are the things that we could see from GMO? Oh, for medicinal sure. Plants? Um, it's already happening. You can look at it on a Google patents um, where they actually are growing the cells of medicinal plants and turning them into trichomes so that you actually say you were growing like a, like a brewery, you know, those giant metal tanks. Yeah. They'll fill that up with cells from medicinal plants, and then they add something, and then it turns them all into trichomes, and then they just <laughs> harvest the tank. And so they're who who's doing that? I, what I don't Google remember, patent? but okay, if we're you gonna have to research in, that. Like, uh, like callus trichome formation, and then put like the actual medicinal plant's name there. You'll probably see it pop up pretty quickly. There's a lot of companies that are working on that. Um, there is a genetic modification to make THC. Uh, well, to make compounds uh, water soluble. So instead of it like, oh, it's an oil and you have to do all of these things, you could just harvest the liquid and then bam, you put the liquid straight into your products and it's already available. Um, it's, it's in solution. You don't have to figure out like, oh, how do you get oil into water? It's already in water. So add it into anything that you need it to be inside of. Um, so there's a lot more like pharmaceutical approaches going into um, these, there's also a lot of the secondary metabolites, um, you know, they're brand new ones that are coming out all the time. You see on the news, they're like, oh, this plus like V and ha now this one has an A or whatever, you know, there's new, new metabolites every day they're figuring out or different terpenes, you know, there's over 10,000 terpenes inside of a single medicinal plant. So like, maybe you're like, oh, well, this one specifically cures this or like prevents this oh my gosh. so you're able to knock everything out so that the plant will overproduce that one terpene right because if it's making ten thousand, it's using up its resources to make all 10 it can't 000. do the other exactly yeah, but if you kill those genes and you only have one it's just gonna pump again this is theoretical yeah. sometimes it doesn't work that way that we think it does but theoretically if you kill everything off and only have one feeding network into a gene you could produce that certain terpene and maybe that terpene is worth more than anything else that you could even grow because it's such a unique compound. Wow. You know, so there's people already working on that. You know, if you find a new compound, let me know, we'll work on it. But it's like <laughs> every, every chemical you can think of the, the main chemical they use for chemotherapy comes from taxol, which is a tree. They actually just grow the cells and have it pump out taxol because 
if you had to grow the tree, you wouldn't be able to produce enough medicine for people that are going through chemotherapy. So you might not even think that GMOs are being used, but they're used all of the time. Even the clothing that you're using, the cotton is probably genetically engineered, maybe to be resistant or to create longer fibers. Um, What's the line in the sand that people start to associate GMO with bad? Is it is it food that we're ingesting? Like, I do not want to eat a GMO bag of chips. I do. But um, yeah, it's just, <laughs> I think it's like the understanding, right? So uh, I, I took a lot of courses actually in how to address the public with genetic engineering and the ethics behind them, right? So currently in uh, my school at Ohio University, you actually have to take an ethics course to finish your um BS degree. That's important. Yeah, it's mandatory. So you are walked through of like, what is okay? What is not okay? Um, and then understanding like the true science, right? Because you eat a leaf all the time, right? And that leaf has genes inside of it, but they don't do anything to you, right? So as soon as you start to really conceptualize of like, what is that GMO? And I mean, not, they're not all the same, right? I could make a GMO that makes poison and now I'm poisoning everybody. But again, it's the intent. And there's a whole process. Like you got to go through like the FDA, the, you know, everybody, you got to go through everybody to get that actually to market. So like by the time the consumer is receiving it, it's kind of gone through like so many boards, so many groups, you have so many testing models um, showing what it's making. Um, but the line is understanding, right? I read all the time that like eating GMOs gives you cancer, eating GMOs like does, does these things. And like, there's no foundation behind that. If you actually go deep enough to research, like not everyone trusts universities, but they are public. And like, I have people that work there. So like, I know that there's no like ill intent of people releasing information. It's like, that's their life work. They're not trying to like hide information. Um, so knowing that, you know, there's no harm in eating certain GMO products again, if they've been right. evaluated and gone through the whole thing. Um, and it kind of depends who you are. Right. So like, personally, I'm all for it. If it was allowed, like if I could make a Pegasus, you know, like a nice <laughs> a horse with wings and we would be out here hanging out, like I might be for it, but there's obviously that line of like, no harm. Right. So I, I work with plants, so I don't have as much of an issue um, with genetic engineering with plants because they don't have as much of a feeling response. Right. There's no pain that you're going to have to deal with as far as things like that. So like plant wise, I feel like it's different. Another statistic, GMOs have saved over a billion lives um, since like coming out. So they are useful. Like you would, you literally by saying like, oh, ban all GMOs. It's like, well, you're also saying to kill 1 billion people who rely on that food source because they genetic engineer like eggplants, right? A normal eggplant might throw one eggplant. They were able to genetic engineer that to throw 10. You have a, you have like a country like India with that type of population, you need to produce enough food for everybody. It, it's the mental space, right? In a first world country, it's easier to, you know, you don't realize, like I said, the vitamin A deficiency for, for golden rice, you would never think that because if you drink like a bottle of like any type of, I don't know if Gatorade has it, but you know, like any type of like nutrient solution, or if you eat a carrot or something like you're already getting so much vitamin A that it's not an issue, but in another country, they don't have any crops like that. So without genetically engineering a crop like golden rice, um, you're literally telling people to die almost by, by saying, well, don't use this technology. Like we shouldn't be. And it's like, go and talk to those people and then tell me that that's not okay. I understand it's your right. choice here, but when it's necessity, that's when I would not judge tissue culture. And a lot of the negative connotation that comes to them is actually the sprayers, right? So a lot of these plants will be resistant to, um, I don't want to say any names, um, but like certain um, pesticides, pesticides, right? So what happens is because the people that are growing them, they're usually in, not in the United States, so it's not as easy to see what's you know actually going on is they run through with planes and spray the workers, right? So they go through and they just spray all the crops because they know 
that none of the crops are going to die because they're resistant to the pesticide, but they don't care about the people. Right. And then there comes out all these things like, oh, well, these things cause cancer. They cause cancer. Wait, why would they continue to spray if if the plants are GMO to be pesticide resistant? They're pesticide resistant, right? The chemical resistance. They're not bug resistant. Ah. So if I spray, this is a unique example, but if I spray everything for bugs and I know that there's no harm to the plant, like the chemical won't burn the plant, then I'm going to go through. And instead of calling the people in, you know, while they're picking or while they're planting or anything like that, a lot of farms just go over and spray through and spray through. And then there's all of these, which some things maybe, but there's a lot of statistics where they're like, oh, well, look, all these things cause cancer. And I'm like, I get what you're saying, but that was a bad practice. You know what I wow. mean? So they yeah, kind of have I to get always go super deep into the case. Cause like, again, every plant is different. Each GMO is a patent of its own. So if you look in the details, I know that probably is like the scary factor, right? You're reading, you know, reading a patent is almost impossible. So super complicated. And then two, just reading information that you don't know the terminology it's hard until you start getting more familiar and more familiar with like, you know, like, what is that word? What is agar? What is MS? Like, what is it? What actually is that? Like understanding the terminology of things. Like when I say FFU to people, that's a fan filter unit, right? Like you would only know that if you're already in the tissue culture space. But if I just told you that you might Google and find something else. So it's all about terminology and then education again, so that people understand like, it's not GMOs that the problem again. It's the intent, the understanding, the review. Like there are reasons to do these things. So when it comes to our industry, David, what is the future of this medicinal plant, GMOs, and tissue culture? Yeah. What does that look like? Um, I think it's going to be mandatory for all commercial growing spaces probably to have tissue culture to avoid the virus, to be honest, because it's so rampant. any viruses, any viruses, um, specific, specifically uh, HLVD, which is running rampant and actually causing a crop loss visually, like I can see it through a lot of grows that are happening in the California area. So I definitely think if you're in a commercial space, you're going to need it. If you're in an outdoor space, you're going to need it um gmo wise the future is what i was telling you with those brewing tanks you know they're going to just start to pump out certain compounds and like that's what they'll extract right you put that right into an extractor and maybe like originally you would have like a one pound yield of oil now you have a 15 pound yield of oil with oh my less, gosh you know the square foot that you took to grow that was one brewing tank rather than uh all those grow rooms, all those lights, these can be done in the dark. They don't require light. So you can cut that cost out. So that's the, the future for GMO, even tissue culture. I, I have personally made trichomes from cells before um, non-GMO, right? So you can use plant hormones. You can change the nutrients that are inside of the media to do that as well. Um, so that's the future. I mean, that you're going to have both, you, you know, there's always going to be a group. I mean, personally for, for this specific medicinal plant, I do prefer it to be natural, right? I, there's nothing that I personally, me specifically need that plant to be enhanced with. I don't need it to be changed or anything. I prefer the way that it is. Um, but I'm not against it, right? If, if I needed that certain compound because I have a certain disorder or a disease, or maybe it just makes me feel better, I'm open to it. I'm not going to say no to a, to a GMO, but I think there's always going to be both. There's going to be that group, one, that are not accepting of GMOs, which is fine, or two, they're just like me where like, well, I don't need you to do that. So there's no purpose behind it. And then the people that go crazy and are having fun. So like some people yeah. like me, like there's things that I'm doing and I'm like, well, I don't really want it, but this is fun, right? Through tissue culture. Like <laughs> yeah. I'm making pollen inside of tissue culture. Like I've been able to pollinate seeds completely sterilely in tissue culture, making flower, making pollen. So there's, there's tons of fun applications and cool things that you can do that maybe is not necessary, but like, why not? You know? <laughs> okay. In the name of science. In the name of science. Yeah. So there uh, is going to be a future where we have uh, 
medicinal plants coming from tissue culture, medicinal plants that are genetically modified and, and grown. And just like the argument with automation and robots, um, there's, there's this whole other, I know uh, Musk talks about it a lot um, in his interviews. There's going to be this whole other problem that we need to solve with, well, what about the, the labor that those robots replaced? What do they do? Well, what about that, right? Like our society will change. So I um, have a view on that, but it's it's not like that because in my opinion, there's a great, what I always think of, I don't know if you've ever seen like the new Willy Wonka movie, like the newest one that has Johnny Depp in it. Oh yeah. yeah so yeah, I've seen that. he gets replaced by a robot that screws the toothpaste on, but then he becomes a technician that fixes the robot that replaced his job. Right. So that's kind of my mentality towards everything. Right. If my job is replaced by a robot that can pick up and cut. Right. Because robots usually replace things that don't require as much mental capacity. Right. It's a lot of physical labor that the robots are doing. So I believe as humans that if you have a machine that can do physical labor, then you can progress even farther. Right. So like maybe it's not as accessible to everybody, but being able to learn how to fix those robots, uh, learning out how to make, you know, those robots are not just push a button and start being a technician that creates media. Like you went from a cloning technician to a media prep technician. Both are honestly, one is a touch more advanced, but both require the same amount of preliminary knowledge, right? So like the jobs that you replace are now created by new jobs. You have to fix the robots. You have to create the media for the robots. You're going to have to certify them, right? You're going to have new engineers that are coming into your industry. You're going to have electricians that are coming into your industry. So you remove something, but I think you gain a larger pool and you also free a lot of time. So like me personally, I've always, I'm a hands-on person. I always work with my staff. I'm in there with them. Like when I say there's a three-person team, I'm part of that team or four-person team, I'm part of that team. So, you know, having a robot that can do that stuff so I could sit maybe, and then actually research more about my powdery mildew resistance or, or these other things. It lets me progress even farther. And then I need technicians to be able to grow those plants, be able to do DNA extractions for those things. So I think it eliminates, but creates, you know? That's a great way to put it. And a, and a good analogy. Um, what about all the companies? Um, how do the companies, let's say producers, processors, and, and then we can talk about seed companies. Um, how do they evolve? And, and, you know, for a couple examples here, let's say you have a, a commercial producer that the genetic varieties that they're producing of medicinal herbs is exactly the same as someone else over here. Do they become more specialized? Do they go out of business? Um, you know, what is the evolution of these companies that um, are growing genetically modified way versus not or tissue culture versus not yeah um i feel like you might not that's something you don't have to deal with because you have such opposing groups right so because you don't have everybody on board with gmos <clears throat> or wanting that preferred i think you'll always have that separation but it's like all the industry right like sugar and things like that and oil the company that will crack it, like that can crack the secret of, you know, producing those brewing tanks that can pump out those metabolites, like it's going to be a whole different type of business. The dynamic shift. Yeah. There'll be more biotech company and they won't be growing anymore and things like that. Um, I mean, it, it just changes how it is. I don't, I don't know if I could answer actually, you know, it's a tough yeah, question and, yeah. and maybe it's more rhetorical. I just, you know, I'm super interested in what the next 20 years looks like. Yeah. Like right now we have a lot of growers. Um, they can differentiate in a lot of different ways, but when these technologies are released, um, and, and adopted at a larger rate, what's going to happen, you know, and for the end consumer, you know, uh, what's going to happen for us? Like to your point, I'm okay with that. Like I'll eat a beyond burger. Do mm -hmm. I, do I prefer the other one? Yeah. But if this is, you know, let's say healthier, more envi environmentally friendly, which I'm not sure it is or not. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm open to it. You yeah. know, it doesn't have to be a burger from a cow. 
Um, I'm sure there's maybe there's some product lines out there that, um, you know, if you're not consuming a medicinal herb and you're consuming an extract of, maybe you don't mind. Um, exactly. And maybe those companies that can uh, adopt and adapt yeah. will be the winners. And, I don't know. And the number one driving factor, money. So Cost. yeah, if if I can provide you an extract from a GMO plant and it's five dollars for you know a gram or whatever, and then this this other company though that's still doing it the traditional way is charging me sixty. I mean, it's just so obvious, especially if you're free market. Yeah, that's if you're like a consumer, but then even if say you're a third <clears throat> party, right? Say I make products from your extracts, I'm not gonna pay a thousand dollars when I could pay fifty dollars. And technically they are the exact same compound and through you know California regulation, anyways, you have to go through testing to verify through like actual analytical equipment, which is the same equipment that you would use in a university, it's showing you they're the same. Why would you pay more? You know, it kind of gets in your head about like the organic section at this moral. Yeah. Like are the you, morality, are you philosophy. Yeah, exactly. Like, how do you <clears throat> feel about it? Because yeah, like one could be health, but then it's just like, yeah, but you're offsetting so much environmental pollution by buying that extract from the other company. So you start to play with like, well, what do you care about the most? And then that's what you'll pick. And honestly, I think like money will drive like anybody that's looking for a cheap cost to go there. Money drives everything. Yeah. And then you'll still have that specialty product, the mom and pop shop. Like that's the quality that people really like that like personal connection. So there's a whole different type of business, I think, because like I love the small mom and pop business. Absolutely. My science degree, obviously, is like, let's push it as far as we can, because you might produce something that could save somebody's life. You know, not it's, it is about cost. But when you have all that money coming in, usually they keep developing it even farther. So you're able to maybe produce more compounds, create more specialty things, save right. more lives. So and and down to the the market, you know, what will the market bear? A consumer going into their retail location to buy their medicinal herb products, um, they're looking for price and they're looking for potency. Exactly. Um, those are the two things today. So why would it change 10, 20 years yeah. from now? No. And if there's a maximization of their favorite terpene effect, flavor, et cetera, as our industry becomes more educated at the retail section or sector, um, I, I would imagine it favors the GMO, the tissue culture Definitely. path. Yeah. Yeah. Because I've, I've seen a lot of people trying to do like um, customized, like customized, you know, medicinal plants. So they have certain terpene profiles that I, I have not looked into this too much, but genetically, supposedly, they like match with you the best. Yes. And then they can make custom formulations for you. So a GMO approach for sure, because you would need to create everything probably separately and then add it together. That's right. Yeah. I, I had this conversation um, with Dave over at Radical Genetics, and uh, we were getting into breeding specifically for medicinal effects. And uh, it, it was like this concept of like a 420 in me where you can have your DNA sequenced over here for what effects this medicinal herb will have on you. And yeah. then being able to go to that company and purchase a subscription or something to just get exactly what you're looking for exactly. from a desired effect. Like I just want something where I'm going to wake up and want to hit the gym and do this and that. Um, or something where it's like, hey, I want something that's a little bit uh, going to, you know, bring yeah. help me wind down at nighttime yeah. and and get a good night's rest, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I I think it like people are working on it. I don't see it oh, mainstream yeah. yet, um, but that's that's exciting to take. You know, maybe it's a a multivitamin approach. Um, you know, whatever the delivery mm -hmm. system is, because not everyone wants to consume in harsher ways. I'll just say yeah. that. Um, it, it could be more accessible if it's just in the roundup of the vitamins that you're taking um, or lineup of the vitamins exactly. that you're taking as a Freudian slip. Um, so um, let's talk about uh, the fate of seed companies. Um, so what what does that look like? Again, with I, I've interviewed seed companies. They've been with us um, in this you know game and industry forever, mm -hmm. um, you know, giving you access to different varieties and menu items and, um, I know we've evolved a certain way, but seed companies are are definitely still, 
you know, uh, one of the the biggest uh, solution providers for helping you expand your operation. Um, what does that look like when tissue culture comes in? Um, will, will there be an equivalent to a seed company, like a tissue culture company where you can buy like culture from or? Oh yeah, um, there is. Uh, so there's already some large scale um, medicinal plant tissue culture facilities that you can contract with and they will, they'll give you thousands of tissue culture plants. Um, so that is happening as far as like nursery wise, specifically for seeds though. I don't know if it would change too much because there's like an up and a downside, right? Everybody hates pollen when you're not trying to have it because it'll reduce your yields and obviously produce seeds. Um, so that's where tissue culture can be super useful to get them to flower in tissue culture, cross pollinate them, you know, exactly what cross you have, not a confusion at all. Um, but your seed output is going to be really low, right? So the flowers that I can produce inside of this box are not going to be very big. So a normal plant, if you were to get it to be pollinated, you're probably looking at thousands of seeds from just that one mother plant. When we're doing it in tissue culture, we're looking at like two or three, you know, or like maybe 10. It, it's just be the size of the flower, how many ovules are actually inside there. So like, it's just not one, it's not easy. And two, it's the yield is so low for seeds, right? So for as far as creating genetics and then the turnaround point of creating those genetics naturally um, is much faster to go through seed and mother than probably through tissue culture. But again, the tissue culture could be more selective. You could pick the exact plant genetically, see which one has more terpenes already, mate them together. So the, there's two approaches. You, you can have the, you know, the traditional way and you're able to produce so many genetic variations <clears throat> at once, and then you can pheno hunt that. But then two, there is the tissue culture approach of doing it sterilely and then pairing that again with the QPCR analytical equipment, I don't need to pheno hunt, right? I'll just look at which one is giving me the amount of terpenes that I want genetically, right? I can look at the genes and look at how much they're producing before they even grow up. So as they're like one, one month seedlings, I can take a clip of each of them, see which ones are producing the most, and then mate those ones. So it's a, it's called molecular breeding. It's a super fast way to get to where you want to go, right? If I'm looking for powdery mildew resistance, <clears throat> if I was a seed company, I would make all these seeds, grow them up, have to look through all of them and see which one is powdery mildew resistance, then mate that with another one, hope that the seeds out of those are powdery mildew resistance, and you need to grow them again, clone that, make sure it grows. So that's a really long process, right? I already know the gene that's responsible for powdery mildew. So for tissue culture, one, I could do it in tissue culture, or two, you can pair up with traditional breeding, right? I'll be like, only use plant one, 10, and 11. Everything else does not have powdery mildew resistance and you're wasting your time. And then maybe that first cross, you're, you're already got it. You already got powdery mildew resistance. You didn't have to spend 10 years or five years pheno hunting and infecting because you already know that it's there. And then you test it out. So they're integrated, the, the two for sure. So you do see a future with both tissue culture and seed uh, providers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's good. Yeah. I, I think... Um, as far as the the history and um, you know, kind of staying true to our roots, again, the seed companies were born out of a necessity of, you know, you want to grow more. So I I'm glad to hear that you think that there's definitely still a place with tissue culture becoming more and more of a norm. For sure, and and me personally, and, and a lot of people I know, like I get bored, right? So like if I go and to a place and see the menu, and it's the same strains over and over and over. I like personally get bored. I look at it and I'm like, oh, I don't want to shop somewhere yeah, else. I don't want anything because this is exactly the same thing. Those seed companies are the ones that are popping out, you know, new, That's right. you have a thousand new genetics after your first cross. And some of them, you know, like, let's say 10% of them are good. It's like, well, there's a hundred new strains on the market right there. You know, wow. so I think that th that's why I will never like go away because like people like me and others are going to be like, I'm bored of that same strain. And yep. yeah, that wedding cake, rosemary, man. 
cream cake, but yeah. <laughs> ice cream cake, rosemary. Yeah. Uh, those medicinal herbs. Yeah. Um, so you have a new company, David, and um, part of what you're helping out with, I think you said was genetic preservation. Yeah. Um, could you teach us a little bit more about your new company? Yeah. So it's a fusion again. So the, the company is called modernfarmla.com. That's like the, the website where we sell uh, plant tissue culture supplies. We sell a little bit of like mycology supplies there, um, trying to be like at home citizen science um, that's on that site. Um, we're still kind of working on it, but um, paired with that is Cacti Fanatici, um, which is my YouTube channel. So if you wanna see like tutorials or demos of me actually making the media nice. or like, I only do cactus stuff on there. So it, it still applies, like everything that I'm saying applies to all of the medicinal plants, but pretty much everything you're going to see on there is cactus or actually like this is an example. So like this is leaves that I grow and you can see, I don't know if you can see, but there's like roots growing out of it. Mm -hmm. um, this is ashwagandha. So it's used for like anti-stress um, and things like that. It's a very popular right now herb, um, but we actually just put the leaves on the media and then it grows roots out of it because you harvest the roots. Um, and we use this for a pain cream on our website. Um, so we actively are using like the tissue culture things and ingredients on there. So the products that you see on that website were either made through tissue culture items, um, or there's actual, like, if you want to go at home and make media, we sell like a liter media kit and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, with there, the Instagram is also attached, you know, it's cacti fanatici. If you want to like see any of that information, um, specifically with that, we're focusing on um, collecting rare and endangered species of cactus, not only cactus, but that's the main focus um, and trying to produce a bunch of them in culture. So like this, you can see it's, it's a cactus. Whoa. Yeah, this one is actually flowered in tissue culture and I was able to pollinate it. Um, I've never seen that in my life. Yeah, nope, it's super rare. Um, and the problem is there's like a really big plant community and people will go into the desert and poach them. So they take about 15 to 20 years to flower. So if you poach it, you literally reduce the population like super significantly. So our idea is to train people at home to grow these endangered plants and species if they're able to get seeds or if they already have a plant or maybe their plant is dying, that's super rare. They can do tissue culture, make more of them. Um, and then we're working on trying to get um, native replanting. So if you're in an area, um, a good one is like ginseng. American ginseng is super um, over harvested. Um, so I'm working with a couple people to actually cultivate ginseng and then we're gonna send them back so they can plant them back to the forest. So the idea is to, if you have a, you know, a plant that's super rare, um, or endangered, like critically endangered, the idea is that we have a tissue culture community that we can work on it and then provide an SOP or a protocol on how to do it, what hormones to use, how much lighting, everything like that, so that you can repeat it and overproduce because we do want them to be able to sell them also, but the fact that they're not poaching them is the, you know, the main goal. So it's kind of a, a fusion of those two. If you want to see my medicinal plant focused Instagram, it's called Botanica Replica. So that's where I put my actual medicinal plants um, and a lot of my work that I'm doing. I work with a lot of like temporary immersion reactors. So ways to grow uh, medicinal plants in tissue culture without agar. So they're giant vessels that fill up with liquid and drain. So you can see all those pictures and have ideas of things that you guys can do as well. Um, but yeah, those are, those are the three, like the two little Instagrams and then the actual uh, website if you want to grab any supplies or just kind of like read a little bit more information. Well, thank you for healing the world. Oh, yeah. um, that is uh, an incredible project, much needed. Um, and just being more resilient is always better, no. right? And, and resourceful. And um, yeah, I, I'm all for that. Um, is there anything today that you think we um, could expand upon or you think we covered everything as far as like a, a crash course on tissue culture and the, the how and, and how not? Yeah, I think so for sure. Um, yeah, I, I think just the biggest thing is just to go ahead and try and then don't be fearful when you get contamination, right? So it's super part of it and it's very discouraging, right? When you have like your... You might only have like two of those cuts and you put them and they both go bad. Like that's just part of it until you first figure it out. So it's just trying again and, and just doing as much research as possible. But 
super at home friendly. Perfect. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining me today, David. Um, I uh, will link all those uh, websites and Instagram no, accounts and uh, everything uh, to get uh, people in contact with you. Cool. Awesome. Thank you. Hey, thanks for tuning in today on the Can of Cribs podcast brought to you by the top brands in the game. We have six categories you want to highlight to help you elevate your craft. Starting off with Cultivation by Grodan, Lighting by Horticulture Lighting Group, Nutrients by Athena, Climate Control by Quest, Post Harvest by Green Bros, and Dispensary by Trees. Thank you to these partners for helping us create this podcast and helping us bring more knowledge to your garden. If you want to support the Can of Cribs podcast, head on over to the link in the description or go to growershouse.com and check out these industry leaders today. And while you're there, hit us up on Instagram. Hit us up on the Growers Network Forum. We have thousands of growers all around the world on both our Instagram and our forum, just like you, looking to elevate their craft. Happy growing.